I, I'm going to challenge you to take your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 3. Uh, that's for everybody if you're watching online or you're in here tonight. And uh, I, I'll give you a little review. So we're doing this thing, and I'm taking my time. To be honest, when I started this, I really thought it was going to be, I was going to answer these four questions, and I was going to do four weeks and, and, and touch on each one each week. That's, that was my plan. Honestly, that was my plan. And the more that I got into this, the more I, I, I got wrapped up. And every time I hit something, I'm like, man, I don't want to just breeze over this. Man, I want to hit this and study this. So here's, here's the second question that we're studying right now is, are we living in the end times? And uh, I, I just want to take this from a biblical perspective because it's easy to say, and Christians say this all the time, we are living in the end times. But if somebody was to ask you, like, how do you know that? What would your answer be? Well, things are bad. Well, things have been bad for a long time. Well, Jesus said he's coming soon. Well, soon could mean a lot of things. So there's a lot of perspectives of this that, that I want to answer. How do we know we're living in end times? What, what answer can we give to people? What, what scriptures can we point people to? So here's, here's some of the points that we've already covered. We spent a whole evening on each one of these. So if, you, if, if you've not seen it, you can go back and watch these online as well. Uh, number one, because we live in the days of multiplied sin. And we gave the verses that the Bible talks about how sin would be multiplied. Number two, we live in the days of a great falling away. And I'm not just saying that because it's easy to say we live in the days of great falling away. We took scripture and history and statistics and we matched them up to explain this. Tonight, how do we know we're living in the last days? We know from the principles of time that God has established. We're going to talk tonight about time. And you say, that is such a weird thing. Isn't it amazing how much the Bible talks about time? So some of these things, I just want, especially if you are a Christian and you've been in church for a long length of time and you are around this a lot, I, I, want, I want to stir your thinking. I want to challenge your thinking. I want to take things that you have known, a lot of pieces from the Bible all the way through, things that we see and read all the time, and just pull out some observations and maybe even connect the dots to say, man, I didn't think, I didn't realize how that connected to this. So... Before I get into this idea of time or this concept of time, I, I want to kind of build a foundation. I think that's important for us to do. So that's where we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 1. And so I, 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 God has a purpose and a plan for everything. Everything that's in the Bible, it's not just random. It's there on purpose. Amen. Same thing with time. God established time. God created time. And so we've got to understand what that is. And so the idea that we're living on God's timeline. So 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1 talks about end times. But within this, we're going to get to a verse that makes us scratch our head and say, huh, I wonder what that means. And I want to answer that. So this is the second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So you got to think, this is, what, this is what God's doing right here. He says, I want to, I want to stir you up. I'm going to make you remember some things. I'm going to point to some things. And, and that's important for us to do. We, we, we think of, look, we look back is what remembering is. Verse 2, that ye might be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us apostles of the Lord and Savior. Now think about what he's saying right there. And be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the prophets. So we're not just looking at what's going on now. We're not just looking at uh, Thessalonians and Revelation and these things. He's telling us now with what he's about to say. He said, you need to, if you're going to understand what I'm about to say, you need to look back. You need to go back to sometimes and look to the Old Testament, the Holy Prophets, what was written, uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, those kind of things. Verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? From, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So they're scoffers. These people are going to come in and say, we've heard this whole, our whole lives. He said, it, it, as, he says, since the fathers fell asleep, he said, even the generations before us have been talking about this. How do you know you're the ones? For us to be that, Jesus is coming back. I know Jesus is coming back. He said, do you understand that there's been people mocking you kind of people for all this time? How are you any different? There's scoffers that are saying this. And, and since the, from the beginning of creation, they've been this. And the question is, where is the coming of Christ? You keep saying that. 
Verse 5, for this they willingly are ignorant of the word of God, the heavens of old, the earth standing out in the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perish. So we have this some illustration that we've used them before about let me go back to the days of Noah when God destroyed the earth with water. And it was the same thing. He preached, they preached and nobody believed it. They didn't believe the word of God. They didn't listen to the word of God. Then the waters came and they perished because they lost it. And that's the thing for us. We don't want that to be our, our generation. We don't want to hear the preaching over and over again. Every Wednesday night, Pastor Tony getting into this and they go right over our head like, oh, I've heard that for years. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of the ungodly men. So now he brings it, he says, I'm not just talking about Noah. What about us? He says, right now, it's the same thing. It's which are now by the same words are kept in store. He said, it, it, it happened then, it's happening now. Listen to this. But beloved, be not ignorant of one thing. That one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. Now, I've heard that joked about, you know, it's for timing. I, I, I've, I've heard it taught in different perspectives. But I'd never put this in line of the foretelling or the warning of the last days and the coming of Christ. I've heard this. Take it in context of what we're reading. And then we should scratch our head with something like that and go, what does that mean and why is that there? One day is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. There, there's a lot to learn from this. I'm going to give you an Old Testament passage because the Bible told us to look back. So let's look at some of this. Isaiah 46, 9. Remembering the former things of old. Okay, another remember thing. For I am the Lord and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times the things that are not yet done. Saying my counsel shall stand and I will do my pleasure. He says this in this passage, declaring the end from the beginning. He's declaring the end by looking at the beginning. It, 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 he's not just declaring or separating, but he said, I'm going to declare to you by the end of the beginning. Now, to, Notice how he says it, the second phrase of that, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So we're looking at what's not yet done, but he says, but I'm going to go back to ancient times to get definition or explanation of that. Does that make sense to you guys as of what he's saying? It's he's, he's a matter of looking back and he says, I'm going to declare to you the end from the beginning. So I, I, I think it's important for us when we're putting the, the, connecting the dots that we have to go back to the beginning and see what he's talking about of connecting it. This thousand years and one day is a thousand years and what, what's not yet done and the things that are happening. But he says, I declare these things to you. Did you see that at the beginning? Declaring the end from the beginning. There's something that we need to understand as Christians. God does not leave Christians in the dark. We're not walking through life going, oh, I don't know. And I know I've said that a bunch of times to this. But God tells us his heart. God declares. God explains. God connects to us. He, he makes this very clear that God is light. And if we're in the light, we don't, we're not blinded to what's going on. We're not figuring things out. We're not walking around in darkness the Bible is filled with prophecy. Why does God fill the Bible full of prophecy? He's telling you. I'm going to tell you what's coming. Old Testament, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus did it like one day and like, well, we didn't know. We didn't know. No, he said, I told you all the prophecy of all these things. Now, we're living in the day and age of the same thing, that we're looking at what God's saying that's going to come, but we don't have to walk around confused. Jesus would say to us today, I told you that. You're, 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 you're walking around as children that should be aware of what's going on. Amos 3, 7 said it like this. Surely the Lord will do nothing but to re reveal his secret unto his servant, the prophets. Think about what he was saying. God doesn't do anything in his time frame without telling you what he's doing. You don't believe me? 66 books right here. He, he, he literally all the way through tells, tells, tells what's coming. He says, you want to know what's going to happen at the end when it comes to judgment, the rapture, uh, you know, tribulation period? He said, I'm going to tell you everything. I'm going to declare it to you. Nothing will happen or should happen that ever catches Christians off guard. Never. 
Let me illustrate it like this. So in 1 Thessalonians 5, 1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. So he, he, he writes it like this. He says, you should already know this. And if you want to know how you should already know it, start in the book of First Thessalonians, the first chapters of that, and all of a sudden, so much is going to pop out at you of him teaching of these things. He said, you already know this, because he's talking to Christians, and we do these Bible studies all the time. So he says this, he talks about the times and the seasons, um, uh, when, it, when he mentions that in, the, in chapter 5, verse 1. He says, but at the times and the seasons. When he, once again, I want to start connecting the dots of this. Jesus talks a lot, or the Bible talks a lot about times and seasons. God talks a lot about time. I've wondered how much of the time we've put together to understand these things. Verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly, you guys know perfectly, that the delay of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Let me correct something, and I hope I've not misled people in understanding this in the past. When we say the words and say, Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night, that is 100% true, but not for Christians. Does that make sense? It doesn't apply. Anytime you read this in Scripture, he is not talking to Christians that will be overtaken as a thief in the night. Because we know he's coming. You know what I'm saying? I'm never overtaken by a thief. If some thief writes me a letter and says, Dear Tony, I'll be at your house at midnight tonight. You know what I'm saying? Lock your doors. I mean, I'm not t- taken. Here I've got the Bible where Jesus says, I'm coming, I'm coming. I'm going to give you signs and wonders and points and verses and timelines and all this other stuff. We are not overtaken as a thief. Because he said, You're, you should not. For you yourselves know perfectly. You know this. You, you've been explained to this, how, we, how I'm going to come for this. So we, lost people are not planning for a thief. They're, they're going to not, not be ready for this. But he says, First Thessalonians 5, 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness. This is so cool. He said, you are not in darkness, that you should be overtaken as a thief. That's what I was just saying. Here are the children of the light and the children of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Light literally means we can see. As, as we're going through, as we're seeing what's going on, as we go through this day and age, it's, it was, and then he says this in verse 6, he says, Therefore let us not sleep, as others do, which are those that are being taken by a thief in the night. You think about what is a thief, what does somebody do that doesn't know that they're going to be robbed? They go to bed. I mean, they're comfortable. He said, not for us. He said, I don't want you just crawling in bed and being like, you knowing I'm coming. He said, you need to be, and he says this, uh, uh, what, let us watch and be sober, to be awake, to understand, to be alert. When he comes, we're to be ready. We're to know that he's coming. We should be aware. And, and once again, I'm not leading up to one of these messages like we've heard for years, you know, 99 reasons why God's coming back in 99. Because I'm going to tell you now, the, the guy that wrote that book was wrong. Okay, I didn't know if you guys realized that, but he was dead wrong. Uh, he was about 21 years off right now. So he was wrong, the one that, and that's an actual book. But this is what Jesus said. He said in verse Matthew 24, 33, So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that the time is near. And we say all the time, no man knows the day nor the hour. No man knows the day nor the hour. And that is absolutely true, and that's a quote from Scripture. But I can declare to you that Jesus said, we can know that the time is near. That's what he said. We can know that the time is near, even at the doors. I've used that illustration before where you're, you're waiting for family to arrive and you say, oh, we're in Kentucky or we're getting close. We just drove through Cincinnati. But Jesus was literally saying, I'm not driving through Cincinnati. I'm in your driveway. You know, and say, even at the doors, that's the description of there. So the fact is we don't know the day nor the hour, but we are given signs and we can know the times of the season. I want to I dive into that. And I know I kind of went a long way to get around to that, but put it like this. Our God has a calendar. Our God has a calendar. He established a calendar. He established time. He established a timeline. Uh, so let's start at the beginning of time and do this. And like I said, I just want to provoke you guys to think. I had this thought, and I, I shared it with a few people, and I said, have you ever thought, and I started, putting the, I started talking about this concept, and then I started researching it. And then I started listening to other people teach on it. And then I was on this trip because I was gone for the last eight days. And I'm on this trip and I listened to hours and hours and hours of teaching and people and perspectives and things like that. And God in my mind kept putting these pieces together. I just want to 
I want to pour that out on you guys tonight of what I learned, what, what I've taught, what I found out about this. So we're going to start in Genesis 1. And that's where we find the beginning. And that's what he said. You'll know the end from the beginning. He says, study that. He said, you're going to know the things that are not yet from, from the things of the ancient. He talked about going back to the prophets and go back to the beginning. He told us one day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. Let's start putting all those pieces together and figuring this out. So at the beginning, this is no shock to any of you guys, but he started with seven days of creation. Six days of creation, one day of rest. Now, God could have created everything just by saying, and let there be, and it could have all been. I mean, he didn't need seven days. He didn't need six days. And I, I think we could all agree with that. I mean, if he create DNA and all that other stuff in just microseconds of speaking it, he didn't need a full week. But everything that God does is on purpose. There's a systematic reason for that. And from what we just read, God said, I want you to study the beginning so you can understand what's coming. So God was establishing some basic principles which everything would follow and be built upon. He was establishing time. God was establishing time. Genesis 1, 4. And God saw the light and that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, I know there's a lot of theories out there about the gap and the fact that God created everything in seven days, but there could have been like a thousand years between the seven years and all that. Just for the record, I totally don't believe in that. I believe when he said in the passage, in the evening, in the morning was the first day. <laughs> the evening, in the morning was the first day. He was establishing time. And from then, all through Scripture, when you have evening and morning was a day, it meant a day. It doesn't mean anything else. So we, we've got the understanding of what he was creating during this time at the very beginning. So God called the light darkness and, the night, uh, and called it night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So six days of creation, which he specifically explained in that, God was doing something different every day that he was doing it. So he was, he was, he was building a pattern here of what he was doing, and on the seventh day he rested— the other way that you could put it, on the seventh day, he finished. It was, it was, he, was, he sat down. It was, it was done at that time. Now, seven in the Bible is the number of completion. And I know some people can get really weirded out when it comes to numbers, and they, and they exaggerate numbers, or they try to make connections. I do not want us making connections to numbers that God didn't make himself. So I, I, I want to be cautious of that because I've heard people like do math stuff and things like that and take things out of context and stuff. But I think there should be an observation of this because it's repeated so much in the Bible. So he was teaching us something through this and he was teaching the, some important principles. So let's, let's, what is God teaching us about time? Number one, look at this. God counts times in sevens. God counts times in sevens. And you're like, okay, we'll, we'll figure this out. This is a foundational principle that goes beyond creation, but it goes back to Israel. I wish I had a week to sit down and talk about these things because I promise you, you just do one research on one principle that I'm about to give you and you could go forever because it is literally the entire Old Testament. In Israel, even to this day, they allow their land to rest on the seventh year. So they had this time period of this. So they would work the land for six years and on the seventh year they allowed that to rest. So this was a principle of time, of completion, of then starting over of what, he was, what they would do with this. And they, they always measured things in sevens. In Daniel 9.24, and it talks about prophecy and those things like that, 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city and to finish the transgressions, and he talks through that. Again, he was using the idea of counting out time with seven or 70 in this instance. In Leviticus 23, 6, and then on the 15th day, the same month of the feast of the unleavened bread unto the Lord, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. I could go on and on like this, but I'm doing these things just to prove a point. Now, you could sit there and say these things are just random, but when God was using things for a measurement of time, God would use the number seven. God used it from the beginning. He uses it at the end. And so I'm going to throw some things out at you guys just to prove this point, okay? It's not just random. In Genesis 7, 4, for yet seven days will I cause it to rain upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Even when you come to the idea of the judgment of God, he started it with seven days. You say, that's random. No, it's specific. He said, I didn't, he, God didn't just say, and I let it rain for long enough to flood the earth. He said, specifically, it rained for seven days. 
In Genesis chapter 41, seven years of plenty and seven years of famine is what Joseph prophesied. Seven years and seven years. Animals, before they were to be sacrificed, had to be seven years old before they could be sacrificed. Seven days they marched around Jericho. On the seventh day, they marched around Jericho seven times. When they were done, it was finished. It was the time of completion. It was a measurement of time. Seven priests were the ones that went before them. They blew seven trumpets. Jacob worked for Rachel for seven years. After seven years, they had seven days of feast or seven days of celebration. When he went for Rachel, which was who he went for the first time, he worked another seven years. It was a measurement of time. He gets married. They have a seven years or a seven days of feast. When they were bringing animals on the ark, they had to be seven clean animals to go on the ark. When uh, Naaman was being, uh, had his leprosy and was being cleansed of that, uh, Elisha spoke to him and said he had to dip in the, in the river seven times. When Jesus was on the cross, before he was said, it is finished, or with the phrase that he said, it is finished, he spoke seven times on the cross. And at the end of it, it was finished. He finished the work of Christ. You say, how much is that used in the Bible when it comes to time? When we're talking about a measurement of time. It's actually used in the Bible 735 times. 735 times. If we're going to include when the Bible talks about sevenfold or the 70th and not just seven itself, it jumps up to 860 references in the Bible when it talks about counting a reference of time with the idea of seven. The Bible started with seven days. The Bible ends with seven days. A revelation goes into the seven years of tribulation period. Started to begin with that. Speaking of Revelation, if seven matters, let's go to the book of Revelation. 54 times in just the book of Revelation, things are measured by seven. Seven stars, seven churches, seven letters, seven candles, seven uh, angels, seven years of tribulation, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowl judgments, seven years. Is it just random? How in the world? And I think sometimes if you're trying to get a point across, you say it a lot. You know what I'm saying? It's like before you leave your house and you want your kids to not break something or not fight. Remember, don't fight while I'm gone. I told you not to fight. And then you text them on your way out of the driveway. Don't fight when I'm... And you're saying, why are you doing that? You're trying to get a point across. You want to get it in their head. And remember, when we were getting into this, how often in those scriptures that he said, look back, remember, remember, remember. He was constantly emphasizing. It wasn't just random. So we start again at the beginning in the seven days of creation. What was God teaching us? Can I just for a few minutes show you something that I read and came across that I just thought was cool? Is that all right? Because I just, and I I wasn't even going to put this in my lesson tonight. It was just one of those things that I'm, I'm reading this and I'm thinking, that is just really cool for me to be a Christian. And I never put the connection together when it comes to this. So, I'm just showing you this because I think it is so cool. And it's not even the the main aspect of my point of what I'm trying to get across. But I've wondered with the seven days of creation, why certain things happen. Number one, I I brought out about the the seven days of why God didn't just say, let there be and it all happened at once. And he did it in a systematic timeline of what he did. And then he even said, and I finished that day and it was good. And I finished this day and it was good. One of the things that I've wondered about that is why God did the sun on the fourth day. Have you ever thought about that? Because a lot of times when we teach kids this lesson, they get this confused. Because you know what happened on the first day? God divided the darkness from the light. Well, in my mind, darkness from the light is day and night. What creates day and night? The moon and the stars and the sun. But it's not. He didn't do the moon, stars, and sun until day number four. The other thing that's a mystery about that is the fact that God created plant life and seed-bearing things that came out of the ground on day three. I would think if they, they need the sun to grow, God would have created the sun and then that and did it like in a systematic way. But he had plants growing in the dark, and then he brought the sun that would feed them the next day. You say you're just reading into it. No, think about it. I mean, everything has a reason. And I think sometimes we don't, get into things and and start wondering what was going on because of that. So could it be that God was explaining history through the seven days of creation? Don't think I'm crazy. Let me explain. Day one, God divided the light from the darkness. Day one. 
Genesis 1, 4, God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided, divided the light from the darkness. Not the sun, moon, and stars, but he divided the light from the darkness. What happened in the first millennial of creation of mankind? Man sinned, and God created and divided the light from the darkness. Happened in the first thousand years. Sin separated man from God. Now, if this is one of those things that you guys could sit there and say, he's just reading into that, I'm just making observations because I simply thought this was cool. Day two, God separated the water from the land. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. The biggest event that happened in the second thousand years was the flood. And God filled the water and then divided it back. And the flood happened in the exact same thing of that description. Day three, God created plant life. But have you ever noticed the reading of it? He says this about seed-bearing plants. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit of the tree yielding fruit after its kind whose seed is in itself and upon the earth and it was so. And he emphasized the seed and bearing and reproducing and multiplying upon the earth when he says that. Well, in the third thousand years or the third millennial of creation of man, God established a covenant with Abraham that would be blessed and his seed would be multiplied. And if you study that, which happened in the third millennia of that, you find that promise over and over again. I will bless your seed abundantly and you will bring forth more and more, which was what it was. Remember I said, what about the sun? Why create man or, or the plant or the Abraham or whatever and then leave out the sun or plant life and leave out the sun? God created the sun, moon, and stars to give light on the day four. Genesis 1.16, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And he made the stars also, and God set the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. In the fourth millennia of time, Jesus came into the world. And do you know how Jesus was introduced? He says, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I am, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. Jesus was around 4,000 4, or, or at the beginning or at the end of 4,000 years. Jesus comes in the world and he is that. And what it was is even with Abraham's age did not have the sun to give them life. And without the sun, there is no life. You think about this. The seed of Abraham walked in darkness until Christ came to give light and he declared himself as not just the bread of life and all those other things that we know. He came and introduced himself as the light of men that I have come to give light unto the world. Day five, God created living creatures. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly moving creatures that have life and the fowl might fly above them in the earth and open the firmament of the heaven. And even when that, what Jesus came to give from the cross, from there to society of the church, he says, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. After the sun came living, things that were alive. Day six, six is the number of man. Six, we see the number of man all through the Bible. And we're not studying the number six. It's just there. But if you go even to the end or in Revelation, when you have the number of man, six, 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 the number of man, and it represents a lot of things like the mark of the beast. It represents the trinity of the satanic uh, leadership that happens during that time. But it's a number of man. But man was told when it was brought into creation that man was to fulfill or fill the earth during that time. During the last thousand years of creation, we have literally multiplied the earth in the way that God has said. Just to prove a point, in 1950, there was 2.5 million or billion people on the planet. Now in 2019, there are 7.7 billion people on the planet. And that's not insane. That's the, like the last like 70 years, not the last thousand years of subduing the earth. What did God do on the seventh day? God rested. What does God do in society or, or, or at the end of society or the end of time of us? 
It says in Revelation 20 when we get to the end, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him in the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled and after that must be loosed a little season. We end the last thousand years of humanity of history with a thousand years of millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So if you notice, Jesus is speaking in sevens all through this. And he teaches the end of history and he makes an emphasis of that. We're not wondering where we're going to live on earth or we're going to reign with Jesus Christ for how long. It is a thousand years and it's specified of what it is. Even during that time, just throwing this out there as bonus, just because every time I was studying, I was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. During that time, do you guys know how long they celebrated a wedding after someone was married? Seven days of celebration is the Jewish tradition. Seven days. Do you know who we are? We're the bride of Christ. Do you know what you have during the millennial or, or before the millennial reign at the end of mankind? You have Jesus Christ coming for his bride. And the Bible is, it tells us that. Do you know what happens in heaven during that time? During how long? Seven years we're in heaven. There's seven years of a party of a celebration between a bride and a groom. And the Bible says in Revelation 19:7. Let us be glad and rejoice, give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. He has said to me, Right blessed are they which called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith, These are the true sayings of God. And let me just plug this in we're there while we're at this. Do you know why it's saying that in chapter 19 and not at the end? Because of the fact is that we are with Jesus Christ during this time. You know, for people to sit there and say, well, no, we're going to come out at the end of Revelation. I hope not because we missed the party. Amen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just all these things that we emphasize of doing that. We're in heaven. It's finished at that time. We have the seven years that is there. The Bible talks about seven years of the celebration of that. I would love to go so far into this. Do you guys know what the first miracle of Jesus was? Do you know where Jesus was at for the first miracle that he did? He was at a wedding. And in, in what he did during that time and the wine and the celebration and there's pots. You know how many pots were there? He filled six pots. The measure of man, of what he came to do. At, anyways, I, another the message for another time. But I am telling you, when you start digging into this, you're like, whoa, okay, wow, this is cool. And you start connecting the dots and it all makes sense. Let me wrap it up with this. Here's number two. Okay, God measures times in sevens. And, and we see this and in, in, in drawing the parallels and the connections and all through the Bible. Number two, God has given us a measure of time. It's not just that he does it. God has given us a measure of time for society. Time, as we know, here on earth was written on a timeline. And you say, that's not a big deal. Let me show you how big of a deal that Jesus or God made this. In Luke 20, in chapter 3, verse 23 through 38, lays out the entire timeline of the Old Testament. It's the passage that we do not read at Christmas. We don't gather kids around and say, all right, kids, before we open our presents, we're going to read Luke chapter 3. Is there, a re is there a reason why we don't read Luke chapter 3? Read it tonight, okay? And, and you'll see what I'm talking about. All it is is the lineage of all these people that go through. Let me just read the last one, okay? The last one, which was, and it goes in reverse, and it counts back from that time all the way to the beginning of time, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. <laughs> you talk about, do we have to wonder where we came from? No, we don't have to wonder. That's why when people sit there and say, well, the earth is billions of years old, or we don't know what the beginning was. Man, God made it so clear. You know why? God does not want us walking around in darkness. God never wanted us to be confused. Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Who am I? Who do I serve? God made it very clear. We can go to the Old Testament and read exactly the same thing, but only plug in numbers. Genesis 5.5. 5. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and begat Enos. And it goes on and on and on. There are parallel passages, except one is in the New Testament. From the time of Christ, when you begin that new dispensation, that new period of time, and God lays it out with them. But if you go to the Old Time or the Old Testament, we have time written out during that time as well. 
Luke 3, God gives us the exact timeline in the Old Testament till Jesus because we have all the numbers in the Bible. Literally, the only, even some of the numbers match up because of the, the fact when they were having the war and they prayed out to God and God made the sun stand still and those different things that we have in the Bible, even that's accounted for. But the Old Testament till Jesus equals 4,000 years. You say, does that matter? Yes, it matters. You know how I know it matters? It's in the book. He, he, didn't just, he didn't put the begats in the Bible so that we would have something to put us to sleep at night. Or something to skip when we're preaching on Sunday morning. Now skip down to verse 30. You know, it's like that's what we do because who wants to read all that? And you say, well, why is it in the Bible? It's in the Bible so we'd have a timeline. We would know time. They're studying the end from the beginning. Creation was uh, 404 B.C. or 4004 B.C. Jesus is at 4 B.C. It's 4,000 years and you say, how do you know that? Because the Bible, go to Genesis 5-5, read it until you fall asleep tonight, and you'll know what I'm talking about. Today, we are A.D. The year is 2020. You go 2020 and go from the zero to 2020, we're at 2,020 years. Now, I'm not really good with math, okay? 4,000 plus 2,000 equals 6,000. I'm taking this straight from the Bible. I'm just, I'm just taking you straight from time of what God established and God made an emphasis for mankind to know time. I, I'm not trying to read any things. It's just, like I said, go to Luke 3, go to Genesis 5, add up the numbers, go through it all, what the Bible says and all these other things. We have it. Genesis till now is around 6,000 years. Going back to Genesis of how things started, there were six days of creation. Six days of creation. Six days systematically of what God did. And you could sit there and say, I think some of those things are stretching or anything. I mean, I think they're cool. I, I, I really, when I was reading, I thought, huh, it's not something that I'm going to, you know, declare and write a book over. I'm not. I mean, but I do, I do think it's fascinating. I think it's cool. Um, six is the number of man. So six is the number that God's given us on this earth. And you say, well, if, if we are talking 6,000 years, well, don't tell me Jesus is coming back because you're short, short 1,000 years, Pastor Tony. Where's my thousand years that I'm missing? The millennial reign of Jesus Christ. When he said, it is finished. And God takes us home because you've ran the race. You've finished your fight. You've done that. And then there's a thousand years of rest that God gives us to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. You say, how do you know all these numbers matter? Why do numbers matter? Tell me numbers matter. Noah lived 950 years. Noah lived 950 years when God chose to punish the earth. Now, I'm not trying to read into things. I'm just reading. Have you ever just scratched your head and said, why did he write that or why that? Do you know when God put him on the boat? When God established this? Genesis 7:11 tells us in the 600 year of Noah's life, 600 years is when God did it before the judgment came. 600, and you say you're reading it. I just know that God made it very clear when he did it. In the 600 year of Noah's life, in the second month of the seventh day of the month. Do you know what that tells me? God was really specific. God was just, I mean, you know what I'm saying? He's just like, I want it on the 600th year, in the second month, in the seventh. You know what I'm saying? It's just so specific of that. You sit there and say, time doesn't matter. God was very specific when he wrote out time, when he was explaining things like this. So you say, where are we at today? Well, we're in 2020. If you were to go back, people debate different days and things like that because of the fact is that there's different calendars that people go through, different calendars and that. They're, now, they're not off by very much, but they are not exact in time of where people say, nobody honestly agrees and says today it's 6,000, 20 years and whatever. You're not going to find anybody saying this, but I can tell you this. 7,000 years or the number seven literally means done. And I'm not reading into that. That's literally straight from the Bible of what it is from Genesis 1 all the way to Revelation. Seven years is done. In the middle of it, you have Jesus on the cross. Seven times he spoke. Seven times he said it is finished of that I said all this because this is a time principle. It's not a countdown. I wish it was. You know what I'm saying? I wish it was. 
you know, if we could come to the church and just say, we have, you know, five months, two days, you know, but we don't have that. God didn't give us a countdown. But you can't deny that all this is in the Bible. You know what I'm saying? You can't deny it's in the Bible. It's in the Bible, and God made a big emphasis out of that, even repeating seven and things like that as we go through this. And I'm just going to declare to you guys right now, we do not know the day nor the hour. Can I just say that? I'm not, I'm not, because a lot of it is like, well, Pastor Tony said Jesus is coming back this year. No, no man knows the day nor the hour. But do we know the season? Is it a matter of God was a God of order and he established an order? So we go back to where I started in 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this thing, that one day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. And it was said smack in the middle of him explaining, go back to the beginning when he talked about scoffers will come in the last days, where is the sign of his coming? And God interjects that verse of a time of days and thousands. And we put the math together and go through there. What was he establishing? What was he making us aware? What was he teaching us? But I'll end with one verse. And the verse that I did not read in that passage, which is the very next verse. It's another verse that I think we read separately, but we don't connect it to end time prophecy and things like that. And that is verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You say, why did God put that in that order? Why did God put it there? And I think when he's talking about the thousand years and God coming in at the end of time and all those other things, it's just a matter of God saying, I don't want to see anybody left behind. I, I, it's, it's not a matter of God just wanting to, to pull us out and leave anybody, but he's long-suffering to us. And I think even with that said, the reason why things are going to get worse and worse towards the end, and God said perilous times or things are going to get really difficult at the end, and guys, things have. I mean, they, they just are crazy. Things have gotten difficult because of the fact is, as things near the end and sin starts multiplying and life gets more complicated, it's a matter of God saying, there's still a handful of people that I know are right on the edge. I, I can't remember the exact number, but I think we had like five teenagers at teen camp get saved this year. It's amazing. I watched it. I was there for most of them accepting Jesus Christ. And I think every time that's, that, that's just God saying, I just want as many. And, and you're saying, why isn't God coming back? And God could be looking down from heaven saying, because of that right there. Because of them. I, I did a play when I was a youth pastor here years ago. And I did a drama, some of you might remember. It's just a thought that God had on my heart. And I did it on the rapture. And then the, the, the drama was called The Last Soul. And I thought, God is the only one that knows. The Bible says not even the angels in heaven know when God's coming back. But I know that there's one day going to be one last person that bows their head and says, Dear God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I accept you as my personal Savior. And God's going to say, that's the last soul. And he's going to come back for us. I just don't think we should walk around in darkness. And I'm not counting like, okay, he's coming back in two more days. or what. I'm not saying that. But I think there's enough evidence to know we are living in the last days. And the Bible says that this generation shall not pass till all these things come fulfilled. When he was talking to Matthew, the end of Matthew. And maybe we're that generation. How long is a generation in the Bible, it talks about it being 70, and there's different times of that and stuff like that. But maybe when we get to the end of that 6,000 years, there is a generation. And somewhere in that lifespan of that church, of those people, God said, I'm coming back at that. And you say, why? Because God says, my plan, my timeline, my purpose is finished.